take-homes that uh, I normally think when there is meningitis. Okay, there are a few take-homes as uh, if predominantly we are a group of MBBS and anesthetists. We are not medicine people. So it is a completely different topic for an anesthetist. When we look at meningitis, it's a completely different topic for an anesthetist. Uh, but it's a very simple topic also, if you think about it. It's a very simple topic. So the first and foremost thing about meningitis is that the triad is very rare. The triad is very rare. That is the first thing you must understand. When we say triad, it means what are the components of the triad? C for negativity. What is the feature of the triad, Amrita? Altered mental state is fever and? Fever and. Headache. Okay, uh, next step. Huh? Next. So fever, neck stiffness and altered mental status. This is the triad. The triad is fever, neck stiffness and altered mental status. This is something, this is something that may be present only in say 30 to 40 percent of cases. So the absence of mucor rigidity or the absence of fever or the absence of altered mental status still does not mean that the patient does not have meningitis. That is something you must remember very clearly. Okay, that is something you must remember very clearly. Are he does not have neck stiffness. Now, when it comes to neck stiffness, how do you assess neck stiffness? Huh? How do you assess neck stiffness? Chandrima, how do you assess neck stiffness? So, there are different things. Neck stiffness is different. When you say Brudinsky sign and Kurdic sign, this is present only in 9 or 10 percent of cases. It is like the rarest of the rarest thing to see. A Brudelski sign or a Kernick sign is one of the rarest things to see. So that is not something that you will see at all. Most probably you will not see them. Okay, 9% of cases, 8% of cases only show Brudelski and Kernick sign. Right, so we are not going to consider that in our discussion at all. So when you say next stiffness, what's common? How do you do next stiffness? How do you figure out next stiffness? Passive flexion, uh, in, in, on passive flexion, there is a rigidity. Yeah, rigidity. Rigidity. Yeah. Rigidity, sir. Resistance is not there, it's rigid. rigid. Okay, so when you flex the neck, there is rigidity. There is, it's difficult to flex the neck. That is neck rigidity. That's nuchal rigidity. It is not side to side. It is not side to side. Side to side will persist. Side to side will persist. There should not be any problem with side to side. But there will be a problem with respect to neck rigidity. So sometimes you see people doing neck rigidity and then doing side to side. It doesn't make sense. The side to side doesn't make sense. It is neck rigidity when you talk about uh, meningitis. Clear? Clear to know? Huh? So, um, when meningitis comes to my uh, mind, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, I have to act quickly. It's a medical emergency, isn't it? And in that medical emergency, the first thing I need to do is quickly do an LT, isn't it? Huh? Why is that so? Because if I give the antibiotic first, I will not get a, uh, the report for the LP actually reduces, the chances of getting a positive report for the LP reduces. Now why is that positive culture important? That pos when I say positive report means culture. When I say positive report means what? Culture. Culture. It may not change the LP characteristic, like protein, glucose, all these things. But it will change the culture pattern. Now why is that culture pattern very important? Why Anti do you think it is very important? Antibiotic, choice of antibiotic and duration. Choice of antibiotic and duration. duration. It is the duration of antibiotic that changes. When you say community acquired bacterial pneumonia, you are virtually not thinking of gram negatives. You are not thinking of Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, E. coli. You are thinking of Streptococcus. You are thinking of H. influenza. You are thinking of Diseria meningitis. Right? Uh, streptococcus, H. influenza, Diseria meningitis, and those patients who are immunocompromised and who are more than 65 years of age. 55 to 60 years away, you are looking at list areas. Right? Now the entire ballgame changes when there is HIA and the CD4 comes on less than 100. Everything changes. Cryptococcus comes in place. But I'll tell you how you can envision the identity by disease. Okay, so you are considering streptococcus, you are considering Nicaea meningitis, and you are considering H influenza. Now, H influenza treatment is long, uh, streptococcus treatment is short. You understand? Nicaea meningitis treatment is short. You understand? That is why we need to understand what is the bug that is growing inside. Right? That is the bug that is growing inside. Clear on this? Huh? That's why we need the culture to come back. Unfortunately, unfortunately, cultures may not be positive. Unfortunately, cultures may not be positive. Many of the times, we may not get cultures 
because normally if you get a cultured positive means the organism has to be more than 10 raised to 5 colony forming units. Okay, the cultures have to be more than 10 raised to 5 colony, which is usually the case for many genetics. So that is why we resort to now faster techniques, and that technique is CSF, PCR, or called as the biofire. We want these techniques in place. So at this given moment, uh, you know, you will uh, you will do the CSF PCR. Uh, that doesn't mean you will not do CSF culture. Why do you still want to do the culture? If we get that is no, with CSF PCR you get. Why do you need to do the culture? Colony down. Sorry. No, culture will not tell you anything about that. Culture, you have to do a CSF culture. What else do you do when you do a culture? Sensitivity. You do CSF culture along with antibiotic sensitivity. You understand? So whether the choice of antibiotics for the prolonged period of time is right or wrong will depend on your sensitivity pattern. So you can't just say I have sent a CSF biofire. Because a CSF biofire will tell you only the organism. It will not give you sensitivity patterns. Are you clear? Huh? Are you clear about what I am talking? Am I, am I making it clear to you all? So when you are doing an LP, my thinking would be let me send CSF biofire and I want to send it quickly. I also want to send CSF culture. And why do I want to send CSF culture? Because there are two things that I am going to do in the CSF culture. One is the gram stain. Mm -hmm. Okay, biofire will still take in our settings around 16 hours because it has to go to a place, it has to be processed, it takes around 4 to 6 hours to process and then get back. Whereas a gram stain can be read right now in your laboratory. In your laboratory, a gram stain can be read right now. A gram stain will tell you whether there is diplococci, whether there is gram negative cocci, uh, whether there is bacillus, which will basically differentiate between streptococcus, Neisseria meningitis, as well as H. influenza. You have a diagnosis. Because when you have community acquired pneumonia, when you have community acquired pneumonia, you are not dealing with anything else apart from this. When you are dealing with a regular community acquired pneumonia, you are not dealing with anything apart from this. And yes, on extreme circumstances, virus. So virus is something that you can't see. Okay, that is something you can't see. So virus pathologies you can't see. That's why when you have a, when you have a suspicion that this patient was not well for a period of time and it is not sudden, all these things. Patient did not have otitis. You know, it didn't have a blocked nose or didn't have a upper respiratory tract infection. Okay, that will go towards bacteria. When you have otitis, when you have this, you will go towards bacteria. But if the patient is just not okay, not finding fine, fever off and on, not okay, that goes in favor of fire. Okay, huh? so you are the condition which will, uh, which will first be your goal. So the LP that you do is, as I told you last time, you do an LP not only for finding out a gram stain culture, uh, also for PCR, biofire, we also want to see the pressures. The pressures are important for us. Now in the realm of meningitis, why is the pressure important for us? Because it will tell you your cerebral perfusion pressure. Right? Huh? What will be your uh, map you want to maintain? More than, more than no. Your cerebral perfusion pressure has to be more than 60. 60. CPP has to be more than 60. That means what will be your mean arterial pressure? It will be ICP plus 0.7 into ICP because ICP is in centimeters of water. 0.7 into ICP plus map. Plus uh, 60. What will your cerebral perfusion pressure be? 0 0.7 into intracranial pressure, which you are finding out by lumbar puncture. Because 0 0.7 into AQ curve, because it is millimeters of mercury. We are looking at centimeters, we are looking at millimeters of mercury, mein karna hai, and that, the, the answer is 0 0.7 into that. Right? So the mean arterial pressure will be 0, uh, will, what you have to keep on, on will be MAP equals 0 0.7 into ICP plus 60. plus 60. You want to keep it both than 60, right? Mm -hmm. huh? So you have to get around that ICP, right? That is why we want that mean arterial. That is why we want that lumbar puncture reading. Clear? Uh, uh, are you understanding this? It's simple, right? It's very simple if you look at it. So with my LP, I'm getting this also. Then what is the other thing I'm getting? If my LP actually shows, actually shows biogenic, do I have to even think? If my LP is uh, showing pus, we have to even think about it. This is bacterial meningitis, right? If it is cloudy, I know this is tuberculous meningitis. If it's cloudy, if it's cloudy, I know there is protein more in it. I need to see there is something wrong here. By visual inspection, I will know that oh, this is protein load or this is oh, this is pus. Are you understanding? 
Huh? And then lastly, what you also see is <coughs> ICP. If your ICP is alarmingly high, like you put the LP, it is coming out buzz, 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 and you put a collar which is showing very high pressures. What is the first thing in your mind? Raise the ICP. Patient is like normal. Patient is like normal. Patient is like conscious, obeying commands. But you find ICP will be very high. What is the thinking that will come to your mind? Cryptococcus meningitis. That is the sine qua non of raised ICP. Okay, cryptococcal meningitis shows very, very high ICP. However, cryptococcal meningitis will not come to you, me, or from the community. It will come only to those patients who are immunocompromised, especially those who are HIV, especially those who are transplant patients who have been on chronic immunosuppression. These are those patients. <coughs> if you have a patient who comes in post transplant, see, you are not working in a transplant center. If you are working in a transplant center, you would have multiple patients coming with meningitis. Multiple patients. You are not working in a retroviral center. If you come to a retroviral center, there are multiple patients coming with raised ICP, you go in LP and you find cryptococcal meningitis. So there you find all these funny things. Cryptococcal meningitis, histoplasmosis, coccidiadomycosis, aspergeosis, mucormycosis, blastomycosis. These are things that you will get in those patients who are immunocompromised. So the moment you think of immunocompromised state is, you start thinking separately. And when I say immunocompromised, it doesn't mean the diabetic patient. It means that patient who is on transplant medicine, you know, whose HIV CD4 comes at less than 100. These are those patients in which I would think of immunocompromised states. So I am thinking multiple things at the time that uh, this patient has come. So we go back to our clinical features and we say headache being one of the commonest features, nucleosity being next, and fever being next, are associated with altered mental states. Now you do a complete clinical examination. Why do you want to do this complete clinical examination? Because I want to determine whether I need to do a CT first before my LP. I need to figure out. Because if this is space occupying region, there is nothing meditated, right? There. Ah, so you will look for right side movements are less, left side movements are more, right? What about you do all those things to figure out if there is focal neurological deficit. If there is a focal neurological deficit, I want a quick CT scan. CT scan. Now see, imagine why they are saying uh, to think like this. Uh, you, you know, CT scan takes barely five minutes, right? It takes barely five minutes. But still, they are saying uh, think before doing a CT scan because you want to go LP faster. Mm -hmm. Are you understanding? So that is the urgency of doing the LP. The urgency of doing the LP is so high, so so high that uh, that you 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 want to even open that CT scan. Oh, five minutes distance to open, five minutes that also you want to open. Are you understanding? Huh? That is why the LP becomes an extremely important thing. Clear? Huh? Of course, you want to look at rashes. Rashes are something that might be present in meningococcal meningitis. Uh, there may be rashes that come in meningococcal meningitis. Some funny viruses can also cause some rashes. Okay, so you have to be careful of those rashes that are there on the body, which will give you clinical clues to understand whether there is something more. With the advent of PCR, these things have become kind of redundant. Because you go PCR, but quickly you have an answer. That's why the case of PCR is so, so important. Clear? Huh? Any, till now, any doubts? Any doubts till now? Any doubts? You can do all that. Now this is all coming. Okay. What, uh, that is all there. Or you can do an optic nurse diameter uh, to see for raised ICP. You can do all that things. But that's not really required to waste your time. Okay. Our entire thinking is, is there a focal neurological deficit that looks like an SOL in the brain? If there is an SOL in the brain, I don't want to do an LP, it's an SOL. Clear? Okay. Huh? So, so now we are clear that we don't do MRIs. That is clear now. We don't do MRIs because we don't want to waste our time at all. That is out. Our question is whether we do a CT. Now that also is me. Or literally not something I want to do because I want to quickly figure out whether this patient has got many child. I can have a patient who has got otitis, who had a ear discharge, who had an upper respiratory tract infection, then became unresponsive. Would you try to do a CT scan here? No. This is that patient who is clearly meningitis. I need an LP quickly. Are you understanding? I need an LP quickly. There's no point. Okay, but I have a patient who was uh, uh, who was having a seizure to begin with. He is having a seizure to begin with. Now, meningitis patients will have first have fever, will have headache, maybe some hyper rigidity. Seizure is the last thing that will come to these patients. But you have a patient who comes in with a seizure. 
with a history of some fever. That patient, no, I will need to figure out whether there is a space of ventilation. You understand? Other than what, I have a patient who comes in with a small fever but has got right side not moving at all. What is this? MCA stroke. Stroke. I don't need meningitis treatment for this patient. I need a quick CT on this patient because I want to thrombolize. It's a completely different thing. Are you understanding? Huh? You are trying to figure out whether this is some other illness other than uh, meningitis. Clear? Any questions till now? Any questions till now? Any questions? Right? We are okay till now? Okay. So, so we are in the clinical, we are in the clinical well now also. Okay. So, you, you can, these patients may also have low blood pressure. Okay. When they have low blood pressure, you normally look at what house prediction syndrome, which is meningitis, which has affected the adrenals. Okay. So, usually meningitis patients will not have uh, uh, low blood pressure. If they start having that, means it's generalized sepsis that has gone in. And of which one of the commonest causes for community acquired meningitis to cause low blood pressure is adrenal getting fired because of meningococcal meningitis. Clear? Huh? So what you understand from this is the gram stain will give you a complete answer if you look at it. You, you see you gram positive coca, it's streptococcus pneumonia, you see diplococca, it's nicene meningitis, you see parod, it's rich influenza, you know, it's so simple. It's actually so simple, isn't it? Huh? Well, you cannot rule out viruses by doing a gram stain. And for these viruses, you actually need a PCR. That's why the PCR comes in place because you can't culture a virus. It's not easy to culture a virus. Clear? That's why the PCR becomes very, very important. Clear? Huh? So now, now uh, in the LP, so what is the what are the things you're going to say as per what she had basically mentioned? You're going to do the CSF glucose. Very important. Low glucose indicates Bacterial meningitis, very low, low glucose <coughs> indicates tuberculous meningitis. So if, it's a if, the, if the glucose is low, it is bacterial. But if it is very low, it might be tubercular. Proteins, I am expecting the proteins to be elevated. What is normal, 50 to 60, anything above that is elevated. Okay, so if you have very high proteins, you are looking towards some kind of meningitis, some kind of problems. Now if you have a condition where the WBCs are low and proteins are high, WBC are low, but proteins are high. This is called as albuminocytological dissociation. Clear? Seizure. Just a seizure will cause it. If your patient has just had a seizure, it will cause albuminocytological dissociation. Anything that causes a problem with the blood brain barrier will cause albuminocytological dissociation. You have increased immunoglobulins, it will cause albuminocytological dissociation. You have GBS, it will cause albuminocytological dissociation. Clear? When you say albuminocytological dissociation, it means what? It means low WBC counts and high proteins. Clear? Huh? So you are you are going to look at albuminocytological dissociation in those indicated patients. In this meningitis patient, I will not have it. In this meningitis patient that we are discussing, WBC counts will be elevated, proteins will be elevated. But if you have this kind of picture, you want to look at GPS, but GPS will present with a presentation. No, this patient has a seizure, it has a fever, a headache. You know, you start looking at what? You start looking at other things. You understand? You may think that there was a seizure at all. Understand? You may think of autoimmune encephalitis. Are you understanding? Then my entire thing will change to imaging and there is in that order. Once I see something like that. Clear? Huh? Then the other very important investigation is <coughs> yeah. So the black No, it won't. It won't. Blood brain barrier should be significantly affected for the WBC counts to remain normal. Huh? Uh, because you understand, if, if the blood brain barrier is affected, then only proteins are going to go into the CSF. Huh? Otherwise, it doesn't move otherwise. You got the point. That is the reason that uh, meningitis per se will not cause albuminous cytological dissociation. Meningitis has got what? WBCs. You understand? Uh, both are going into meningitis WBCs. It's not albuminous cytological dissociation. Both WBC will go up, protein will also go up. Clear? But another very important biochemical parameter is CSA lactate. Though it's not a very great parameter, though it's not a very great parameter, what you can understand? It is not going to what what do you think CSA lactate will tell you? Any idea? What does CSA lactate tell you? It doesn't tell you that. Because see, what will happen if there's a bacterial meningitis? Let me give you an example. 
you have a patient with bacterial meningitis. Okay, this patient has now or 21 plus meningitis has now developed vasculitis and vasculitic infarcts. In the CS, you will have lactates that are elevated. You understand? If you have bacterial meningitis, you have CSF and, and you have got vasculitic infarcts, your CSF lactate will elevate. Clear? Huh? But it will give you an idea that if the CSF lactate is elevated and I have bacterial meningitis, okay, this condition is sick, he is very sick. But other way around, if you have a patient of nosocomial meningitis, now what is the problem with nosocomial meningitis? This is a patient who has undergone some kind of brain surgery. Uska, uh, he, he has undergone say a tumor excision in the brain. He has undergone a tumor excision in the brain. Right? He has undergone a tumor excision in the brain and now he is spiking fever. A very difficult case, extremely difficult situation. When you have a patient who has had a brain surgery and now patient has spiking fever and you want to rule out meningitis. What is the problem? You do a CSF, you get blood, you get cells, you get protein. Blood brain barrier disrupted, you are having a surgery that is done. So obviously there will be some blood there. That will cause the WBCs to change, that will cause the CSF to completely alter, proteins will change because there are presence of WBC and RBC in that. Are you understanding? So will your CSF routine give you an answer? No. no. Culture, really. It's like already these patients are on antibiotics, your culture pattern to get out of culture will be reduced. Are you understanding? Are you understanding? Mm -hmm. Am I clear to you So what left by is a biochemistry parameter, CSF lactate. So when you do a CSF lactate in such cases and the lactate is elevated, definitely it's not viral. I'm looking at bacterial pathology here. So it probably may be a bacterial pathology. So in nosocomial meningitis where my LP will not work, uh, a CSF lactate may give you kind of an estimate. But that doesn't mean if I repeat my CSF lactate, it comes down, patient is improving. It doesn't mean like that. It just tells me that my CSF lactate is elevated. This could be meningitis. Clear? Clear? Till now? Till now it's clear? Hmm? Okay, so we are, we are now in that stage where the patient has come to us, we have decided we didn't want a CT scan, we have done the LP, we know what to send in the LP. Now we know what to send in the LP. Right? We know what to send in the LP. We know that there are few things that I want to do immediately that's keeping the mean arterial pressure up. Huh? And that mean arterial pressure, how much to keep up is dependent on my LP. Huh? And I know very well this patient should not get the fever because that is causing problem in his body. <coughs> so I'll put the patient on paracetamol. So paracetamol is on. Mean arterial pressure is taking up. Which is the drug you want to use? Noradrenaline. I use it peripherally. I don't have a central I just start peripherally. When I'm doing a lumbar pump, I'm doing it in the supine position because I can't do it in the sitting. The sitting, the pressures will not be right. I'm doing it in the supine position. Right? Clear? Hmm? Now the CSF comes back. The CSF shows WBC counts to be 100. Okay? And, uh, and, uh, and proteins to be 400. Now I have a problem. Now I don't know whether this is bacterial, viral or what it is. I don't know. Proteins are elevated. WBC counts are not thousands. In bacterial meningitis, your WBC count should be 1000 as you that picture. It will be thousands. You are having 400, you are having 300. Now the problem arises. Okay, now, now I don't know what is to be done. Well, glucose was not 34. The, uh, w, uh, the neutrophil count was not 1180, which is specific for meningitis. What is specific meningitis? Uh, w, the glucose being less than 24, WBC being more than 2000. Uh, the neutrophils being more than 1180 and the proteins being elevated to more than 100. So this is sine qua non for factory meningitis. Right? But yes, I mean, I said, everything is not such a perfect world for us. It's everything is, is, is a matter of a lot of clinical estimation, a lot of clinical examination to understand as we do medicine, isn't it? To understand what this is. So do CSF uh, and I get something that is midway. That's where the problem arises. That is why we say empirically, empirically when we start antibiotics, we start all together. Are you understanding? That is why when we say empirically, we say start everything all together because when I am saying community acquired pneumonia, yeah, it could be either bacterial or it could be viral. It's probably not going to be fungal. Clear? So we are not starting fluconazole. When you say bacteria, we are looking at streptococcus pneumonia, we are looking at H influenza, and we are looking at Nicerea meningitis. The treatment of all three is what? Ceftriaxone. All three is what? Ceftriaxone. That is why the treatment of knowledge remains septriaxone. But she added a bacomycin. What is the bacomycin added for? Sorry? Sorry? 
No. Why is mycomycin added? So very rarely, two percent of cases in the entire population of Streptococcus pneumonia are drug resistant. Very rarely, out ninety-eight percent of patients are not drug resistant. Only two percent of cases of pneumococcus, Streptococcus pneumonia, are drug resistant. Only a small amount of cases. Only two percent of cases. Only two percent of cases have got drug resistant pneumonia. So for that two percent, we are actually adding mycomycin. Are you understanding drug resistant? So if I say that no, I don't want to add mycomycin, am I really wrong? I'm not wrong here because ninety percent of cases is going to be Streptococcus pneumonia, which is sensitive. This is community. Coming to the community, no? This is not the hospital that you get resistance pattern. This is coming to the community. Are you understanding? That's why you don't need higher antibiotics. You just need ceftriaxone two grams. Now that comes to the question: Why ceftriaxone two grams? Two grams. Why is it high dose? Why is vancomycin only given? It's two grams. It's not one gram. It's two grams vancomycin. It should uh, pass. It has to blood. pass through the blood-brain blood barrier. Blood. And what is the problem? You are giving what? So if the blood brain barrier is inflamed, antibodies will pass better. Steroids. If it is inflamed, steroids, which is reducing the inflammation. inflammation. Steroids are reducing the inflammation, right? When we, you understand, no? Am steroid there? Eh? Am log ek tarikhe se we are thinking that okay, the blood brain barrier is inflamed, so my antibodies will go in better. Okay. However, I am giving steroids, which is reducing the inflammation of the blood brain barrier, right? Uh, so I hope that is why I want good and effective concentration of antibodies inside the brain. And that is why I end up giving high doses. So, ceftriaxone two grams, vancomycin two grams. High doses are going inside. That is if I am thinking of, if I am thinking of, if I am if I am thinking of streptococcus meningitis, H. influenza meningitis, and next year meningitis meningitis. Here, huh? And I should rightly put it, dexamethasone when we are giving, huh? It is not. It, it the older trials did show some alteration in mortality. Only in those patients who had streptococcus pneumonia, it was not altering anything else. And later on, trials actually suggested that it doesn't even change mortality; it just prevents reduction in deafness. It just reduces deafness. You understand? It just reduces deafness. Is what they basically went on to say. But at the end of the day, we don't take the chance. We don't take the chance. We give the steroid. Okay, we give the steroid because mortality is very important ball game. It showed one one study did show that. That's why we don't take a chance. We give the steroid. Importance: when do we give it? How much do we give it? What is the dose of steroid? So when do we give the steroid? Before first dose of antibiotic. Either with or before. Either with or before the antibiotic, I would give the dose of steroid. How much? Ten milligrams. Ten milligrams. The dose is ten milligrams four times a day. Now uh, ten milligrams four times a day is the dose. Zero point one five milligram per kilogram is the dose. Zero point one five milligram per kilogram is the dose that is supposed to give. In patients who are having uh, um, meningitis. Now the difference between this steroid and tuberculous dose steroid is not the dose; it's the duration. Okay, here what you're giving is four days, whereas there you're giving is an extended period tapered over 21 days. That is the difference. You understand? Now huh? with tuberculous and 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 meningitis, we're talking about bacterial origin. Clear? Clear? Here, any any doubts till now? Huh? So, which are those patients in which I am having? I, I need a, a second antibiotic uh, after the mycomycin, after the antibiotic. It is only those patients who are uh, more than 60 years of age, and I am suspecting this patient to have which bug? Listeria. So, if I am suspecting listeria, that is one place where I want to give another antibiotic, and the antibiotic is ampicillin, because listeria cannot be managed without ampicillin. Here, this here cannot be managed without ampicillin. Two grams four hourly. That makes it almost uh, six times in a day. That's twelve grams of ampicillin per day is approximately what will be going in. Huh? Twelve grams of ampicillin. Clear? This here cannot be managed without ampicillin. Clear? So in this case, if I decide to give meropenem, how much will I have to give? High dose. Again, comes to two grams. You understand? If I decide to give meropenem, but why would I give meropenem? There is no reason only to give meropenem here, right? You are understanding. There is no reason only that patient has got streptococcus pneumonia, H. influenza, Neisseria. Why should I give meropenem? I should give ceftriaxone because our country does not have drug-resistant streptococcus pneumonia. We are not dealing with gram-negative organisms. 
Before a cough, will you take meropenem? No, because our cough has streptococcus pneumonia, right? Huh? You don't need that meropenem in your work, but that doesn't make sense. Hmm. I don't understand, it doesn't make sense. You got the point. Huh? You end up creating other problems. Clear? Huh? So we have gone through uh, what I want to treat, uh, what we, how we started with the clinical examination. We have gone through uh, why the clinical examination is having so many more limitations because sensitivities and specificities of all these tests are not good. In fact, even a procalcitonin may not get elevated here. Though procalcitonin, so you might say, let's do a procalcitonin. A procalcitonin tell me whether this bacterial infection. No, it's a localized infection. Meningitis is only in the brain. As any deep seated abscess in the body will not cause the PCT to go up. Any deep seated abscess in the body will not cause the PCT to go up. Remember this. Uh, so in the meningitis, you will get a PCT to be normal. You understand in the diagnosis of meningitis, you will get a PCT to be normal. Are you understanding? Uh, so we decided, we, we, we now understand that this is this requires swift management. It requires a swift LP. It decides swift decision making whether a CT is required. Okay, you have come to a point. That is why we, we cannot wait for culture patterns to come. That is why there is one more thing I want to add. Because if I have a picture, the picture might be slightly different. I want to give something fast. What is the next thing? Why is it not being covered cover in this? We said community acquired pneumonia could be viral, could be bacterial. Isn't it? We have not covered virus. That is why every patient that comes in, give 10 milligram or kilogram of ASI to begin. They do. You understand? They do. You understand? So what together I'm giving? I'm giving a steroid, I'm giving septraxone, I'm giving a cyclone. These three things I have to give. Acrobacy, give or not give? Take away. Are you understanding? Clear? Huh? So I'm going to give 10 minutes of a cyclone. Clear? Yeah. Because it's going to take me time, right? It was going to take me time for PCR, so I give septraxone. It was going to take me time for, to, to understand dysteria, I give ampicillin. It was going to take me time for virus also, no? Which is coming to PCR, so I have to give the antivirus also. What is going to give? ASI yes, okay. That is a before the next dose of all these three things. What do I require? Steroid. My PCR level. My PCR outcome. I want my PCR outcome. It's very essential to get my PCR outcome because otherwise I will end up getting these antibiotics for a long period of time. Are you understanding? Huh? So, uh, in that PCR, there are two important viruses, three important viruses, if, if you ask me, that, uh, that would be there. Okay, which are those three? Herpes simplex, huh? enteroviruses, and varicella zoster. There are three important viruses that community acquired that you may get. Varicella zoster, huh? enterovirus, which is very common, and herpes simplex. Okay? There are three of these viruses that you will probably look out for. That's why when you see a PCR meningitis panel, in your PCR meningitis panel, you will find streptococcus, Neisseria, H influenza, you will not find Klebsiella and all these things. And at the end, uh, you get virus, which these are the viruses you probably get. Clear? Herpes simplex virus, enterovirus, ecovirus also they have, and, and you have Galicella zoxas, BZD. Clear? That's why the PCR becomes so, so important. You are understanding why the PCR becomes so important? Because you, you may not even culture that virus. If you do it just a gram state and a culture, you don't even, So how do you figure out in certain cases before PCR came, what did we do? We did an MRI. So if this patient did not improve, did not do well, what do you do? You do an MRI. What does the MRI tell me? So I have not even thought about MRI till now. We talked about your CD scan. What does the MRI tell me? The MRI, when I want to do an MRI, I'm not just do an MRI. I'll do a full MRI with contrast. Why do you want to do the full MRI with contrast? When I do an MRI with full contrast, I get something called as leptomeningeal enhancement. We may get it. It's not that it will many checkers can to enhancement If you have uh, you understand, if you get leptomeningeal enhancement, you are looking at uh, in the context you're looking at bacterial meningitis or meningitis for that matter. What you also get is if the temporal temporal lobe, you will get enhancement there. Uh, encephalitis pattern there. That is synaponon for viral illnesses. In the temporal lobe, in bilateral frontal areas, bilateral frontal temporal areas, you may get Enhancements that is synaponon for viral viral illnesses. Other thing you may get is a raised ICP. You may get a raised ICP. You may get basal exudates, which will signify tuberculous meningitis or very high bacterial loads of bacterial meningitis. Right? Uh, and importantly, you may get infarctions and meningitis thrombosis. 
Streptococcus pneumonia, 10 to 20 percent of person of cases may get venous thrombosis, which will alter the treatment modality. A good number, some small number will also cause infarctions, but that infarctions are lesser than tuberculous meningitis. You can get several infarctions, but it is lesser than tuberculous infarctions. Clear? Huh? So you understand why we are doing the MRI? Why we are doing the CT? We understand. Why we are doing the CT? Because they are trying to rule out everything else, like suburban blood like uh, like uh, space occupying lesion and things like that. Why are we doing the MRI? Because I didn't get a diagnosis and I want to see what is what is, what is happening to my patient. I will pay, like for example, I have a patient with meningitis and uh, the patient was not okay, was fever, was altered mental status. No, two days ago, the patient improved. Not happening. To once you given the antibiotic, there has to be some change in the patient's general condition. If there is no change in general condition, either your diagnosis is wrong, uh, or probably this patient has worsened on the brain. The worsening of the brain is what? Vasculitic infarcts. Vasculitic infarcts. Worsening of the brain is what? Infarcts. Raised ICP. Hello. Uh, what are we talking about? She got the reason why we do the MRI. And MRI contrast why we are doing, we want to also see the venous and the thrombus. I want to see, apart from the recommended enhancement, I also want to see when there is thrombosis. It will tell me when there is thrombosis of the sinuses. Which changes the treatment, isn't it? It changes the treatment, changes the alters the prognosis. It's a lot of things that you do. Now, you are in a condition where you are in, this is, this is with respect to community acquired meningitis. Huh? The same protocol to manage neurocritical care happens over here, where if the patient's GCS is low, you will intubate. If the patient has got seizure, you will give anticonvulsants. You will not prophylactically give it. You will, you will keep the temperature, you will keep the head high. That, that protocol remains the same. That protocol in care of overdose patient remains the same. That will not change. That remains the same. The only thing that might change is the antibody. You understood now. Huh? About meningitis. Clear? It is about, it's clear till now. So, uh, if, what if I don't get streptococcus pneumonia? I may want to stop my dexamethasone. If I don't get streptococcus pneumonia, I may rather stop because it's shown its effect only in pneumococcal meningitis, streptococcus pneumonia. It doesn't really work otherwise. So why do we have something that is not going to work? In viral illnesses, there is a query effect after four days. Huh? In a viral illness, after four days, there is a query effect to give steroid. Whether you want to give steroid after four days. Mm -hmm. Clear? Clear on this? Huh? Now let's cut across to something that is more difficult. Difficult is nosocomial meningitis. Okay. Till now, this was very clear. You know, we are dealing with streptococcus, oh, Neisseria, H influenza, and hysteria, and some viruses. Okay, the treatment of which is very clear. You don't have to think too much. You just give septrax or acyclovir, dexamethasone, and, and if it's old, you give uh, ampicillin. Uh, and rancomycin, if you think of drug resistance, streptococcus pneumonia. Here, huh? it's very clear. There's nothing, you want to put ki baati nahi hai It's so simple. Isn't it? It's so simple. You don't have to think also in this case. But when it comes to nosocomial meningitis, it's a completely different volume. It's a completely different volume. Why is it completely different? It's completely different because of the fact that now you're dealing with a completely different set of organisms, which may, which usually is Acinetobacter pseudomonas. Okay, which usually is Acinetobacter pseudomonas. Now, why is it usually that? It's because after all, it is nosocomial. Okay, what with the organism that remains in the environment for a long period of time is usually Acinetobacter. Okay, and these organisms become, that is why, you know, you have these drains and pipes inside the brain, ventricular drains are inside the brain, that gets infected. You understand? That gets infected causing nosocomial meningitis. You understand? One of the reasons that external ventricular drains are not good is with this particular entity being a problem, nosocomial meningitis, where diagnosis, where clinical features, where duration of treatment, where the antibiotic choice, everything is a question. You understand? Everything is a question. You don't know how much duration to keep it on because in this you know 7 days, 10 days, 14 days, we know that. 21 days, this year, we know that. Okay. Here, we don't know how long to keep this because the EVD is in place. I can't remove that EVD. There is an accident of factor. What do I do? Replace, pull, pull, take it out. Nothing we know. We are not certain what is to be done. So on an average, on an average, imagine a patient who is on ICP, very high ICP. The EVD is placed for raised ICP. Now that EVD gets infected with acinetobacter or the CSF goes acinetobacter, what is in your mind? Remove that EVD. But if you remove that EVD, what happens to ICP? You can understand how difficult this becomes? Huh? 
it becomes extremely difficult if you have to manage a case like this where there is raised ICP and at the same time your EBD is infected or your CSF is infected. It becomes one of the most difficult things to do in, in, in meningitis. Okay, it's very difficult. That requires great coordination between the doctor, the patient's relatives and you to explain the issue. You understand, huh? So the sub-surgeon might say, okay, the ICP is not very elevated, let's just take it out, give him a free period and then reinsert it back. Some may say, let's not do the EBD, he will die. So this is all a complete dialogue, there are no guidelines. Huh? But in which ways, personal view is, if there is an EBD, get the EBD out. It's very important to get that EBD out, otherwise your antibiotics are not going to work. Now, which are the antibiotics? It depends different, definitely on the bug. It depend, depends on the bug. Now, you, that is why you should know your hospital flora. What is there in my hospital? If my hospital has got that, you understand. Basically, what is there in your hospital? Na? Do I have an antibiotic that is predominant in my hospital? Do I have a pseudomonas? Or do I have a Pepsiera? Or do I have E. coli? This is what should be there in my brain. Right? If I have a patient, if I'm dealing with traumatic brain injuries, if I'm dealing with diabetes, I should know my flora. If I don't know my flora, I will not know what I have to treat with because empirically I have to give something. What I, what I know now, all my techniques are not going to give me results because they have all received antibiotics. It will not give me the right result. A PCR at this stage will show you dead bacteria. We will not know whether it's that is the bacteria or whether that's just a genetic product. So everything becomes a problem here. So I want to give empirical antibiotics. That is why we send repeated cultures. You understand? It is, in that you send only one culture, no? Here what is happening? Repeated cultures. I will send culture, again next day I will send next culture, third day I will send next culture because what? I want to know whether what is a bacteria growing. I want to know whether I am dealing with Acinetobacter, I am dealing with Pseudomonas, I am dealing with Klebsiella because I cannot give a single antibody for all three. You understand? I cannot give a single antibody for all three. Huh? I will need to give a combination antibody in the first place. Okay, of which, say for example, and if I have the highest amount of isolator in my institute, what will be the antibiotic of choice? It will be cholesterol and nothing more than cholesterol. You understand? Now, the, what is the issue here? The issue is I need cholesterol to enter into the brain. Can I get polymixin? No, it doesn't enter the brain. It doesn't enter the brain. What I can give only cholesterol? Are you understanding? If I want to give cholesterol to enter the brain, it has to be high doses. Because how much penetrates into the brain? Only 10 to 12 percent. Only 10 to 12 percent of anything penetrates into the brain. That is okay for a streptococcus pneumonia. That is okay for an inflamed meninges there. But it is not okay for a gram-negative bacilli of the variety of acinetobacter which has got extremely high virulence. Are you understanding? They have extremely high virulence, so it is not okay for that. That is why when you are treating meningitis inside the brain, especially ventriculitis, I would want to give a combination of IV and intrathecal. IV and intrathecal. Here, yeah. so in these cases, I would give IV antibiotic and I would give intrathecal antibiotic. Intraventricular antibiotic. Now, how much to give? How much to give? To know how much to give, there is something called as inhibitory quotient. It's called as inhibitory quotient. What is inhibitory quotient? It is the level of antibiotic inside the CSF divided by the MIC. Level of antibiotic inside the serum divided by MIC. That gives you an idea. And that should be equal to 10 to 20. That should be equal to 10 to 20. That level should be, that number should be 10 to 20. Clear? Huh? Serum level of antibiotic divided by MIC. MIC just before the next dose of antibiotic. Just before the next dose of antibiotic. Say I added cholesterol uh, uh, 3 million units 3 times a day. Say I added 3 million units 3, 3 times a day. Or and I gave morning 2 million units of cholesterol I intrathecally. Evening, I will give you another dose of intrathecal uh, cholesterol. Before that dose, I will collect this inhibitory quotient. I will collect the serum level. I will put serum level divided by the MIC. By the, what I need the culture. Without the culture, I won't get MICs. Uh, so, uh, this culture, if that is 10 to 20, I am okay. But if it's less, I increase the dose. Okay, start dose. Titration of problem. Clear? It's titration of problem. Clear? Uh, so, and now the question that comes is, what do I do? Do I give it for 5 days? Do I give it for 6 days? Do I give it for 1 week? Do I give it for 14 days? What do I do here? So the usual practice is to give it for 21 days. Usual practice is to give it for 21 days. People have done all sorts of things by repeating CSF lactates to understand whether that is good, doing well. And, but none it has not shown to, it has not shown to be corroborative. 
So it is after all a clinical status of this patient. It is uh, a good clinical judgment on whether the patient has done well. Okay, uh, even if you repeat CSFs, you will not get because CSF per se is not okay, no? CSF per se is really not okay. CSF will keep on showing some, some uh, protein, some RBC, some WBC, keep on showing. You cannot look at CSF and decide. That is why you end up giving very long, long treatments, 21 days sometimes, more than that. So 21 days is one of you have to give 21 days. Beyond 21 days, then I give that will take a call. That's a clinical call. Here? Then it's like after, uh, uh, as you are going to be RBA and after when we are giving 5 cellular zone, then we have to calculate inhibitor quotient every time we give That is the, that is the protocol. Nobody does it. Okay. So, it, it is easy if you have a CSF ventricular drain. Intrathecal you do it is easy, no? You have ventricular drain. You open close. But you know, you must remember every time you are doing it, you are going to introduce an infection into a closed system. Are you understanding? It's not easy. It's not easy to get some CSF collector or base CSF collector or base It's not easy. We used to do it when I was abroad, I used to do it. But it was, a, it was a tedious process. And then we used to end up giving very, very high doses of cholesterol. You understand? It used to be very, very high doses of interesting things that we used to give. So if you have a ventricular drain, if you have a ventricular drain, it, you know, it, you still feel it's simpler to give the antibiotic. But if you don't have a ventricular drain, I have to give an LP, no? Every time. Every time put the patient on, go ahead and give it, you know, LP do give it. It's not easy, it's not easy at all. It's not easy at all. So on an average, we 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 just uh, give an average dose and we observe these patients. I, I don't think anybody in Mumbai or anybody in India at least does these inhibitory quotients. I am not aware of anybody who does this. But this is what you know, what we should know that this can be done this way. Clear? Clear on meningitis? Huh? I hope I've made it as simple as possible. Right? Huh?